U-boat commanders were known for their bravery, skill, and daring exploits during the Second World War. But beyond their reputation as fearless warriors, many of these commanders were also some of the strangest and most eccentric characters in military history. From their peculiar habits to their unorthodox tactics, U-boat commanders were never short on surprises. However, there was one commander who stood out from the rest, Wolfgang Luth. In this video, we'll delve into the life and career of Luth and explore why he was considered one of the most unusual but successful U-boat commanders of all time. Wolfgang Luth began his naval career in April 1933 after studying law for three semesters. In the summer of 1933, he spent the traditional three months on the sailing school ship Gorch Fock, and then went on a nine-month training voyage around the world, India, Indonesia, Australia, North and South America, on the light cruiser Karlsruhe. After a year on the light cruiser Königsberg, he transferred to the U-boat force in February 1937. In July 1937, he became 2WO, second watch officer, on U-27 and made one patrol in Spanish waters during the Spanish Civil War. In October 1937, he became IWO, first watch officer, on U-38 under Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Liebe and was on patrol in September 1939 when the war began. After a short time on a school boat, he took over the small type Daihu B U-boat U-9. During six patrols on this boat, he achieved his first successes, most notably the sinking of the French submarine Doris in May 1940. A month later, Oberleutnant Luth commissioned the Type Nalker D U-boat U-138. During the night of 2021 September 1940, on his first patrol in the new boat, he sank four ships with a total of 34,633 tons, a great coup for a small coastal type U-boat. In October 1940, after returning from his second patrol, on which he sank one ship and damaged another, he received the Knight's Cross, the only commander of a coastal type U-boat to win that decoration. He left U-138 that month to take over the large Type 9 U-boat U-43. During five patrols on this boat, he sank 12 ships with a total of 68,077 tons. He left U-43 in April 1942 and in May 1942 commissioned the Type 9 D-2 U-181. In September 1942, Captain Lieutenant Luth left Kiel for his first patrol in this boat. The operational area included the Indian Ocean as well as South African waters. He reached Cape Town, South Africa at the end of October, and during the next two weeks sank four ships with a total of 21,987 tons. On the 16th of November, he received a radio message announcing he had received the oak leaves to his Knight's Cross. Before returning to base, he sank eight more ships in the following two weeks, totaling 36,394 tons, arriving at Bordeaux in January 1943. In March 1943, Capitan Lieutenant Luth left Bordeaux for another patrol in African waters and the Indian Ocean. This patrol, under difficult conditions, was also very successful, with 10 ships sunk totaling 45,331 tons. During this patrol, Luth became the first U-boat officer to receive the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. This patrol was also outstanding because it was the second longest patrol of the war, lasting 205 days, second only to Kentrat's incredible 225 days on U-196. To maintain morale during this patrol, Luth pioneered various ideas, such as publishing a ship's newspaper, holding contests of various types, and other activities designed to keep the crew mentally and physically fit. He spoke on this topic during a conference of Navy staff officers in Weimar on the 17th of December 1943, providing a fascinating description of the psychological problems which could arise due to the extreme length of such a patrol. The entire text appears in Terence's The U-Boat Offensive, 1939 to 1945. In January 1944, after more than five years of uninterrupted duty on U-boats, the highly decorated Corvette and Capitan Luth took command of the 22nd Training Flotilla, which trained future U-boat captains. In July 1944, he took command of I Abteilung, 1st Section, at the Marina Schule Flensburg Murvik Naval Academy, where future Kriegsmarine officers were instructed, and in September 1944 became the youngest ever commander of the Marina Schule. I just want to take a quick 30 seconds to thank you all for your support and helping to keep these stories alive. 
If you'd like to learn more about the heroes of the greatest generation, we have a free daily World War II newsletter where we go into more detail about some of the lesser known stories. If you'd like to help honor and keep their memories alive, you can click the link in the top right or in my pinned comment below. Thank you again for all your support. We appreciate it more than words can express. Now let's get back to the story. Triton, king of the seas, belched loudly as another man was dragged to the foot of his throne. Like the prisoners before him, he was dressed like a beggar and covered from head to foot in diesel oil. The king yawned and began to pick his nose ostentatiously. Name? Schmidt, your majesty. Well, what do you want? Triton leaned forward to see better. You are a wretched little thing, aren't you? The crowd around the rickety throne laughed hysterically, and Triton, a huge smile on his face, nodded and held up one filthy hand for silence. Guards, give this man a whack for impertinence. Two men stepped forward. Schmidt bent over and was smacked soundly on his bottom with a pine plank. Triton sighed, his eyes closed, his wig askew, his finger still in his nose. What was that you wanted again? Holy baptism, your majesty. Triton frowned and waved his hand limply. Take him away. Work on him for a while and then we'll see. The crowd went wild. Poor Schmidt was dragged off for another round of public humiliation, physical abuse and chemical poisoning. He was smiling as he went. For King Triton was only a shipmate named Grobelny in a false beard. His court was the weather deck of a gigantic U-boat. And Walter Schmidt was having fun. Wolfgang Luth, the commander of U-181, laughed and clapped along with the rest of the crew. But as Schmidt was led away, and the next man brought before the king, he separated from the crowd, walked over to the railing, lit a cigar, and gazed out at a horizon as empty and as blue as his Fuhrer's eyes. It was the 16th of October, 1942. U-181 was on the equator, 500 nautical miles southwest of Freetown, and headed south at seven knots toward the Cape of Good Hope. The sun was out, the weather deck was too hot for bare feet, the temperature in the engine room was approximately 140 degree Fahrenheit. The ceremony going on behind him made it all the more difficult to believe that nine months earlier the ice on his last boat was so thick that hammers had to be used to knock it off. Luth had been a U-boat commander for almost three years by October 1942. His performance during those years, if not the stuff of legend, had been better than adequate and he had matured in the job. His first boat was U-9, a Type II Einbaum commissioned in 1935 and the namesake of Otto Wedigen's old SM U-9. In four patrols he sank three ships, the first two in a farcical manner. His second patrol, a mining operation, was saved by the luck usually associated with fools. During Operation Wesserubung he had been assigned to a position outside Bergen, where he was thoroughly bored, and shortly after the invasion he had fired four defective magnetic torpedoes at the Polish destroyer Grom, all of which missed or misfired. After U-9 came command of U-138. It was at this time, June 1940, that Luth became irritated at having to leave the front for her commissioning, but ultimately he won the Knight's Cross as her commander. Curiously, after almost three months spent commissioning and shaking down his new boat, Luth was allowed to make only two war patrols, both of them in the western approaches during the wild month of October 1940, before he had to leave for command of a third boat, the larger type 9B boat U-43. Within three months, one of his watch officers allowed her to sink in Lorient Harbor. Another man might have been cashiered, but Luth was eventually forgiven, and over the next 12 months he chased the Bismarck in 1743, cheered Operation Barbarossa, saw the untouchable Americans in his crosshairs, and sank 22 ships in five patrols. Five days before Victor Ern left Wilhelmshaven for the North Atlantic in May 1940, Luth had departed the same harbor in U-9 for the English Channel. They would be the only two German U-boat commanders at sea for most of the month, and they made a striking contrast. They were as different as day and night. Ern was a handsome man, not dashing but handsome in the saturnine way of a sleek and well-fed burger. His appearance on the bridge of U-37 in May 1940, every hair in place, calls to mind the image of a successful businessman looking only slightly out of place lashed to the wing of a small airplane. Wolfgang Luth was a plain-looking man, although he looked less so after a shave and wearing a pressed uniform. Bald, with a pointed head, a large nose, and a gap between his two front teeth wide enough to push a pencil through. Ern was urbane, a diplomat, a thinker. Luth had neither diplomacy nor tact. He was remarkably rude, 
and he was pushy, prying, and utterly prudish regarding other people's personal lives. He was not a sentimental man. More to the point, there was a critical difference in the way the two men went about their work. Ern was tentative, torn between the desire to succeed and the need to temper his destruction with charity. He sank ships because he had to. Luth was as cold-blooded about his work as any predatory animal. On the 9th of May 1940, for example, he sank the French submarine Doris off the Dutch coast. When the Doris blew up and bits and pieces of her crew rained down on U-9's bridge, he was unmoved. Poor fellows, said my watch officer. They were only U-boat sailors like us. But war drives feelings like this into the background. It is either you or me. If we hadn't sunk them, they would have sunk us or one of our comrades. This attitude was not uncommon, but Luth held it more firmly than most of his fellow commanders. He had no idea of the suffering he caused, said his friend Theodore Peterson sadly, when he sank ships. As his career progressed and his numbers mounted, Luth's behavior became worse. He developed a reputation as a political man. He was one of the few officers in the U-Bootwaffe who openly admired National Socialism, and he took every opportunity that arose to say something favorable about the government or the party. His mean streak became more pronounced. As Theodore Peterson said, he had no idea of the misery he caused every time he let loose a torpedo. In April 1941, he shot the French sailing ship Notre Dame du Châtelet to matchsticks and killed several men, not because she was a threat to anyone, but because he wanted some target practice and he was smarting from the tongue lashing Carl Donitz had given him for scuttling his own boat in Lorient. Not something I would have done, murmured Carl Friedrich Merton, who had once let a similar ship sail. Luth's prudish sense of morality was very annoying. He nagged his men to get married and have children. If they were married, he nagged them to be faithful and have even more children for the good of the Reich. He restricted them to the boat so they could not visit bordellos. He followed his officers around to make sure they did not cheat on their wives. He banned pinups and unhealthy reading material from his boats, and he never drank. It is not easy to imagine Luth relaxing in the Scheherazade. Peterson dragged him into the Lido once, and he was shocked to learn that there were nude women inside. Clearly his behavior was odd, and many people thought it approached eccentricity. Wolfgang Luth, said Lothar Gunther Buchheim, was the craziest man I ever knew. Few commanders with such character flaws could have survived. There is no doubt that some were fervent Nazis, some were morally straight-laced, some were bullies, some were even psychopaths. But none of the top commanders, the aces, carried all the baggage Luth carried, and yet he survived and prospered in the u boot Waffe. By the time he left the front, he was second only to Otto Kretschmer in tonnage sunk, and his career, which lasted from the first day of the war to the last, was arguably more impressive and more rewarding than that of any commander in the service. Such hardly seems fair, or even fitting, until one realizes that Wolfgang Luth's faults were like so much chaff compared to his one great virtue. This virtue, which made him a superb military officer and a tolerable human being as well, was his sublime ability to lead men. The responsibility of a commander to his crew formed the leadership style of Wolfgang Luth. It drove him as a leader. We know this because Luth took the most time and trouble to explain his idea of U-boat leadership, and he authored the single most important first-person document on the subject, a lecture he delivered to a convention of Kriegsmarine officers meeting in Weimar in December 1943. This lecture, which Luth entitled Problems of Leadership in a Submarine, was an immediate and sustained success, first as a teaching tool for the Kriegsmarine, then as a legitimate source of information for historians. It is the best written description of the mind games that so often went on inside a U-boat. It is one of the most candid and unexpurgated statements of personal opinion from a commander in wartime. Problems of Leadership, which is about 10,000 words long and would have taken over an hour to read, is divided into five uneven sections. In each section, Luth discusses one of the factors he thought necessary for good leadership in a U-boat. Discipline, success, shipboard routine, the example of the officers, and real spiritual leadership for the men together with a genuine concern for their personal welfare. It is as good an outline as any for such a lecture, even if Luth adheres to it only casually. One of Luth's favorite leadership tools was competition. He made a contest out of anything, no matter how dull or how odd it was. After the boat's doctor, Lothar Engel, had presented his De Rigueur lecture on hygiene and venereal disease, Luth arranged a poetry contest on the same subjects. 
The winning entries were predictably vulgar. He had a tall tales contest in which contestants tried to outdo each other in telling lies. He held a shipboard Olympic Games, a drawing contest, chess and card tournaments, and a singing contest that was broadcast, with commentary, over the address system. He encouraged a sense of competition with the few other boats in the Indian Ocean by printing each boat's tonnage totals in the newspaper. He had a talent for taking advantage of the unexpected. One could only manufacture so many things to do within the hull of a U-boat, even a boat that was 88 meters long with three deck guns and her own refrigerator. Thus it became very important to adapt external events to fit the need. Sinkings were always best for interrupting the tedium, and Luth liked to turn them into special events. During a chase, he would summon crewmen onto the bridge to look at the ship through binoculars and identify it. During an attack, he would keep the crew informed of torpedo firing, target angle, expected runtime, hit or miss. After sinking the Panamanian steamer Amaryllis in December 1942, he allowed his crew to haul an entire sheep aboard. Fresh meat was rare on a long cruise and the sheep was chopped up and roasted with enthusiasm. He was a strong believer in celebrating holidays and birthdays. Any holiday, no matter how obscure, was the occasion for a party. The most important of these, of course, was Christmas. On Christmas Eve, the officers' mess was dissolved. The entire crew ate together, presents were distributed, and songs were sung around a Christmas tree made out of green toilet paper. But Easter was also cause for celebration, and so were Mother's Day and Father's Day. Luth made a lot of these last two because he had such strong views on the value of family and the responsibilities of parenthood. By the time he returned from his last patrol, he had three children. Birthdays were celebrated in U-181 with songs, parties, cakes, and cognac. The day the boat crossed the equator was when Luth held a wild crossing ceremony preceded by weeks of publicity and commemorated with hand-lettered certificates. Finally, U-181 was one of the few boats in the U-Bootwaffe that observed the Fuhrer's birthday. In the closing paragraph of Problems of Leadership, Luth stated clearly and simply a very simple truth. A commander's first obligation, his first thought, his first love, must be his crew. He blows the opportunity completely, wasting it on one last gratuitous wheeze of Nazi ideology. The result is a curious welding together of his greatest virtue, the virtue that led him to present the lecture in the first place and made him famous despite himself and his greatest vice. Ironically, one of the more positive reactions to problems of leadership came from a prominent American submarine commander, Edward L. Beach. My general impression of the lecture is that it was right on target, he stated, making allowances for the differences in submarines and our own submariner experiences during the war, his practices would have applied perfectly well to us. He agreed that some of Luth's methods were pedantic, but so were mine in a similar situation. Others he considered genuinely innovative and only wished that he had thought of them himself. As a prize in one of his competitions, for example, Luth would stand a man's watch for him. This had a double effect that no submariner would miss, but which others might. The skipper could stand any watch in the ship. I don't know if I would have had the self-confidence to do that. Would Luth's style have worked in one of Beach's boats? Probably not, because both the boat and the crew would have been different. But he was smart enough that he would have thought up appropriate things for the same objective, and they would have worked about as well. Problems of leadership should be recognized for what it is, an imperfect but illuminating glimpse into the practice of good leadership at the U-boat command level. It is the best glimpse we have, even though it is badly written, politically skewed, and easily mocked. To get a better idea of the qualities that made Luth special, one is well advised to skip it and listen instead to his men. Their bond with him has lasted over 50 years and transcends death. Capitan Luth was a man to depend on, wrote Franz Parrish, one of the crewmen on that last long patrol, and I can say with great pride that his entire crew stood beside him and, as one would say in German, would go through fire for him. There are no men like him anymore, sobbed Walter Schmidt. Some of his contemporaries found his ideas on crew management naive and even laughable. Commanders who endured frequent and deadly attacks from the aircraft and escort vessels that dogged them in northern waters found little to relate to in the problem of needing to keep crews amused during monotonous patrols. Buchheim's Das Boot ridicules Luth's famous lecture on problems of leadership in a submarine, 
Although the lecture actually occurred two years after the events in the book were supposed to have taken place, it is clear who Buchheim means when he pokes fun at a long text from a speech by Lieutenant Commander L. Luth's paternalistic attitude toward his crew was also well known. Not only did he believe it was his duty as a leader to be concerned with the well-being of his men, even after they had left his boat, he also controlled their personal habits as much as possible. All reading materials brought on board had to gain Luth's personal approval, and pin-up posters were forbidden, part of a campaign to stamp out sexual problems on board. He actively promoted his theories about the proper way to maintain physical health on patrol, going so far as to require certain items of clothing to be worn, and forbidding or closely regulating the consumption of cigarettes and certain foods and drinks. However, Luth's style of leadership seems to have evoked lifelong loyalty among the majority of his crewmen who revere him to this day. He also continued to assist his men in their personal affairs and careers after he left U-181, taking time from his busy administrative schedule to respond to their requests for help. He was clearly a charismatic leader of men, similar in this respect to Gross Admiral Donitz, who stated after the war that Luth had been earmarked for the position of the Befehlshaber der Unterseebote, or BDU, which was the supreme commander of the German Navy's U-boat arm, U-Bootwaffe, during the First and Second World Wars. However, because of his political leanings, had Luth survived, he would have undoubtedly served a long term in Allied captivity and may even have been barred from serving in any position of authority after his release. Only a few days after the war ended, he died in a tragic accident. On the 13th of May, 1945, Kapitan Zursi Wolfgang Luth was shot by a sentry at the Marina Schule when he failed to identify himself or give the password. The unlucky shot, fired by the sentry at a target he could not even see in the darkness, struck Luth in the head, killing him instantly. There has been much speculation as to why he did not respond to the sentry's challenge. Some have suggested it was deliberate suicide, others that Luth responded but the sentry failed to hear him. The most likely explanation is that he was drunk, exhausted, or otherwise distracted as he made his way across the grounds of the Marina Schule shortly after midnight on the fourth day after Germany's surrender. Luth was one of the most controversial of all U-boat commanders, first and foremost because he publicly advertised his firm belief in the tenets of Nazism. But other aspects of his personality and even his successes have also found their detractors. Although he sank a huge tonnage of vessels, his successes occurred mostly in African waters and in the Indian Ocean, areas which offered relatively easy pickings with light defenses compared to the North Atlantic. Two days after his death, Luth received the last state funeral of the Third Reich. Six U-boat officers decorated with the Knight's Cross formed the honor guard, and Donitz spoke the last words. Wolfgang Luth was credited with the sinking of 46 merchant ships plus the French submarine Doris sunk during 15 war patrols for a total tonnage of 225,204 gross register tons. This makes him the second most successful U-boat ace for tonnage sunk. A memorial stone at Marinashula Mervik still honors the memory of this outstanding U-boat officer today. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.